We would like to welcome you to our new series on the book of Daniel, where God reveals the future history of mankind. Now, Daniel tells us we are in the last moments of human history and concludes with God's redemption of mankind. We invite you to stay with us. We know you will be blessed. I'm reminded of how much I need to know You are for me, you're not against me You are with me, I'm not alone Through all the darkest times and brightest days I know some things will always stay the same I'm not alone. Well, we are really glad to be back with you again this week. And we have another exciting presentation. I hope Daniel chapter 8 is going to be a very, very interesting but very challenging message that is so relevant to the time in which we live. I want to take just a moment, and Sherry takes us to the Ruby Mountains in the northeast corner of the state of Nevada, just uh, east of Elko. And uh, this is a huge alpine meadow beautiful stream at the bottom of the valley and sherry thank you so much for taking us there uh, i look at those mountains and say you know i could probably climb up parts of those it could be a lot of fun um, the steep parts i'll leave to the younger folks to take care of but thank you sherry so much so faith and hope for today is our series daniel chapter 8 and daniel is about to get a prophetic update now you're going to discover in this presentation that since our last conversation, Babylon has been conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire. So chapter 8 takes place under an entire new regime in Babylon. So that has to be the setting from which we begin our conversation. So in Daniel 8, you have the story of the ram and the goat, God is going to reveal to Daniel some significant information. And I want you to pay attention because this is part of our discussion we had in chapter 7. So Daniel is now in the Medo-Persian Empire. God reveals the empire will fall to the speed and power of the Greek Empire. You ready for this? Daniel 8 verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time, and I saw in the vision, and it so happened that while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw a vision that I was by the river Ulai. Then I lifted my eyes, and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the other, the higher one, came up last. That's representing the Medo-Persian Empire. Verse 4, I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Now keep in mind, beasts always represent civil powers or authorities or empires. And that's very clear, as you can see in the text. In verse 5, As I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable, notable horn between his eyes. That Remember horns represented kings in chapter 7? Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and he ran at him with furious power. Confronting the ram, he was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns, there was no power in the ram to withstand him. But he cast him to the ground. So 
you could see this power and that that ram that is coming uh, out of the east uh, with how do I say this? Uh, I'm sorry, the goat confronting the ram had such power. Now, if you go back and read the history of of Alexander the Great, who was the general, no force could withstand him. His army wasn't large, but some historians have actually written that it almost appeared as though God created miraculous victories for Alexander the Great because his small army going up against larger ones had such profound victories. And in this story, it says that the Medo-Persian Empire, the ram, there was no power in the ram to withstand the force of Alexander the Great's army, and he cast him to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. In other words, there was no help for the Medo-Persian Empire at all. Verse 8. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. In other words, he's now ruling the known civilized world. But when he had become strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up towards the four winds of heaven. Now, you can read in your history that at the death of Alexander the Great, his kingdom was divided amongst his four generals. And I find that to be just a perfect parallel to this story. But we want to pay attention to something else that is happening here. Out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south and the east and towards the glorious land. Out of one of them that would be the four winds came this little horns. I'm going to pause here. Some would say that he came out of the four horns. And some would say, well, the gender in the Hebrew language would say, well, this horn actually emerged out of the four winds. And I'm going to say it doesn't really change the interpretation of this passage itself. Whether this horn emerged from the four winds or whether it emerged from one of the four horns, both will fit perfectly. In verse 10 it reads, And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. So what I'm saying is that this horn that emerges out of the other horns or out of the winds has a spiritual connection and it grows clear to the host of heaven and cast some of the host and some of the stars to the ground. Uh, some interpreters, I think, correctly interpret this to say that it becomes a persecuting power against any who may disagree with it. Now, I'm going to say that this little horn is now reaching beyond the Greek empire. The little horn reaches into heaven itself. It is a civil power speaking religious language. Religion and faith are shaping civil authority through the inappropriate merger of the state and the church in this story. Now, I'm going to tell you again, God never intended for the church to need the power of government. He said, I will send you the Holy Spirit. He fully intended the church to be spirit-empowered, not civil government-empowered. And whenever those two come together, history has documented over and over and over. We'll get into that a little more in just a moment. Verse 11, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. In other words, he now is claiming to be equal to Christ. You see, the prince of the host is Christ. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away, that horn is taking away the daily sacrifice, and claiming to replace the heavenly court with an earthly one. And it says in verse 11, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Notice the his, the H, that's God's sanctuary, was cast down to the earth. Did you notice that? So I'm going to read verse 11 to you again. 
He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. He's claiming to be equal to Christ. That's blasphemy. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Verse 12. Because of transgression or rebellion, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Verse 13, and I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? So you understand that this civil religious power is going to be attacking the sanctuary of Christ in the heavenly realm, bringing it down to earth, and he is going to be trampling, persecuting the host. That would be persecuting the saints that we read about in chapter 7 are being trampled underfoot by this religious civil power that has emerged Verse 14, and he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now, the answer is somewhat different than the question. Okay? How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation and giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? You see, the little horn power reaches into heaven. It is a civil power speaking religious language. Religion and faith are shaping civil authority through the inappropriate merger of church and state. In verse 10 it reads, And it grew up to the host of heaven, and cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. So I want you to understand that this civil religious power is not your friend. That it creates religious conflict and persecution of any and all who disagree. And how can it do that? Because it has the power of the government behind it. It, does no, it no longer has the power of the Holy Spirit. It has abandoned the Holy Spirit for power. I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to just say something very plainly. We are facing a unique time in, in religious history. What I want to say to you is this. So many young people really want nothing to do with the church today. We just had this conversation in a public forum the other day. And, and there's just something happening with young people in religion. They're just saying, you know, there's something wrong with it. We just don't want to be part of it. At the same time, religion is trying to insert itself into the public realm through public education, through civil legislation to impose religious dogma on the population in America. The reason the church is struggling and needing to use civil power is because she's no longer working through the Spirit of God. Notice verse 11. He then exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now the prince of hosts is Christ. The horn is taking away the daily sacrifice and claiming to replace the heavenly court with an earthly one. So when a religious organization claims to be God on earth, you have the fulfillment now of the prophecy given in Daniel chapter 8. Verse 12 reads, Because of the transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth down to the ground, he did all this and prospered. 
So what I'm going to tell you is that if he casts the truth to the ground, what did this religious power replace truth with? And I'm going to tell you. He's replaced the truth with tradition. And the church is no longer about the truth as it is in Christ by faith alone. It is about the power and the authority of the church to impose its dogma through civil power. He did all this and it says this religious power is going to prosper. Verse 13, then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. This is a symbolic vision. This 2,300 days will be symbolic prophetic time. 2,300 prophetic days. And I'm going to show you a profound principle. Prophetic time, 2,300 days or years in prophecy, is one of the longest time prophecies in Scripture. The start date of this time is provided for us in chapter 9. We'll see that when we get to chapter 9. Now notice verse 15 of chapter 8. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there was before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. When he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. And he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. So you need to understand that this vision isn't about Daniel's time. It isn't about the time of the Greek Empire or the Roman Empire. This is about the time of the end. That sets us in the proper place. Now in verse 18, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he, he touched me and I stood upright. And he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. So now we know where Daniel is at. Here we go, verse 20. The ram you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Meda and Persia, the small one and the great one, remember that? Verse 21. The male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its global dominance, not with its power. Verse 23, In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, the little horn having fierce feature, who understands sinister themes. Now, I want to pause here for just a moment and help you understand. Do you realize where our form of government in America has emerged from? We come from the democracy that was created in the Greek Empire and utilized and developed as a republic in the Roman Empire. So we have roots in America reaching back into the Greco-Roman empires. So what we experience today within our democracy has ancient roots, if you would. Verse 24 reads, His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. This is a religious persecuting power that emerges and is in conflict with those who live by faith alone. Daniel 8, 25. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princesses, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. 
This did not apply in Daniel's time. It is going to happen a long time in the future. It says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I rose and went about the king's business, and I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Let's see if I can cover this in the next few minutes for you. We have met this religious political power before in chapter 7. Here, we meet it again with more clarity as to its mission and purpose. We also know today that when Christian religion embraces political power, she always, always becomes a persecuting power. This power comes on the scene and plays its part in the time of the end, as the prophecy stated. Now that prophecy shocked Daniel. The prophecy that shocked Daniel was that the worship of his God would be turned into an abusive, persecuting power. The history documents the early Christian church taking power in the 6th century and reigning for the 1,260 years from 538 to 1798 the church embraced two things, unquestionable authority and civil authority. The two things that can fully replace the need of God and the Holy Spirit. The religious wars devastated Europe as a result. 30 to 50 million people died in these religious wars. The pilgrims left Europe and came to America to escape state-sponsored religion. America exists for freedom of religion. The U.S. Constitution was written to prevent a particular religion becoming a state religion. The Establishment Clause is now being disregarded by legislatures in many states right now, and they are seeking to create state-sponsored religion, and Daniel says we have been warned. This is what the Constitution reads. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Any religion joined with the state is the greatest threat there is to religious freedom. Which religion will it be? If we, if we decide that the state is going to approve just Christianity, how is it going to treat non-Christian religions? What if the state decided to endorse a non-Christian religion? Then what would happen to the rest? You see how the conflict immediately emerges? Which religion will it be? This is the conflict caused by the little horn power. It is seeking to enter a wedge into civil power. Our public schools are state institutions. Putting religion in school means that you open the door to any or all religions. Our forefathers saw this as a danger. This is why the pilgrims immigrated to America to escape state religious persecution. And we're watching right now religious individuals trying to legislate to put religion, their opinion of religion, and impose it on the rest of the country. There has been tension over the influence of religion wanting the support of the state for many, many reasons. One of them is money. Religious institutions want state education dollars to fund their schools so they can indoctrinate people. Education has been the most common problem. Prophecy tells us this is what, this is, I'm sorry, I'll read this again. Prophecy tells us this will be what brings religious persecution back in the end times. So what have we just said? Chapter 7, Little Horn Power, a persecuting religious power that is in embedded in civil authority. We come to chapter 8 and we discover that clear back in the Greco-Roman Empire in Greece, in the concept of democracy, begins the emergence of the power that the little horn is going to use and abuse to, in the very last days of Earth's history, 
impose religious dogma on the entire nation. I would say in the book of Revelation, it grows into a global conflict. Now you think, oh, Steve, that's got to be just the craziest thing I've ever heard. Well, we just happen to have what is called the 1,260 years that we studied in chapter 7 called the Dark Ages. Ended up with the Pope being incarcerated, arrested by General Berthier in the French Revolution at the end of the 1260 years. Spiritual abuse, abuse got so out of control that even in England and other nations wherever the head of state become the head of the church, people were persecuted. It doesn't matter whether it's Catholic or Protestant. Any time any religion needs the power of the state, it has forfeited the gift of the Holy Spirit. And your religion and your belief system is a threat. Now you say you're making this up. No, I, I'm reading to you right from the book of Daniel. What it says is going to happen. It is not possible it is reality that it is going to happen and you and I as Christians have a responsibility to say you know God empowered the church with all the gifts she needs she doesn't need the power of the state because it will corrupt and make us something that is beastly and persecuting and cruel as history has proven the church is capable of being and here we're told we will see it again, possibly you and I, in our own lifetime. I believe every child should have the freedom to pray in school. But I don't believe that we should empower every church, I'm sorry, every teacher to impose their church's belief on a classroom. Because we do not know what those beliefs are. And you may not want your children to be forced to be taught those things. But the tensions are rising in America as they do periodically right now. I want to take you to just another one of those beautiful places. El Capitan is just back off to the right here. Uh, beautiful, beautiful mountains. And we're there right there probably in May, late April, early May. The snow has melted just beautiful place. Sherry, thank you for taking us here. I hope you have a blessed rest thank of your day. Thank you for day. watching Go today. Our email address is ScreamingRockMinistries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho 83303.